Uh, as Alex mentioned, uh, my name is Carol Lynch. I do work for the Australian Geospatial Intelligence Organisation, or AGO. Uh, we're a part of the Department of Defence, and we provide geospatial services to uh, other parts of the department, as well as to the Australian Defence Force. Uh, today, so today I'd like to talk to you about a project which my team and I undertook within our Amazon Web Services environment to devise a cloud-native approach to generating raster types. So as a developer, I do have a bit of a tendency to get bogged down in detail, but for today, I'd like to keep the talk pretty high level. So most of the people in this room will have a pretty good understanding of what the content we're going to talk about, um, but I'll just give a quick primer for those who might be a little less aware. So I'll be talking a lot about AWS. So AWS, of course, is Amazon Web Services, uh, which is Amazon's cloud ecosystem. Where I talk about specific services, I'll try to define them clearly, and uh, in some cases, I'll talk a little bit about why we might want to use them. How's that, guys? So is that a bit better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, it'll also be helpful to have a, a basic knowledge of what I mean when I talk about raster tiles, uh, especially as, uh, as they relate to tiled web services. So let me start by going over the problem. So last year, the Department of Defense acquired a global imagery data set from Airbus. That uh, data set provided high resolution imagery across the surface of the Earth, and it looked something like this. So obviously, this is just a few of the highlights. Uh, in reality, the world is a big place. As, as we all know, it takes a lot of data to cover it. Uh, in the case of the Airbus data set, we're talking about 187 terabytes of data, uh, and that was in JPEG 2000 format. So our aim was to take this large data set and service enable it so that our customers could uh, efficiently access imagery, um, basically as a tiled web service. So most of our customers simply require this uh, data as a backdrop to their uh, operational planning and for situational awareness. So we're not talking about uh, providing out the data itself, but rather just a visualisation. Uh, so a tiled web service works well for this purpose. So how would we normally accomplish this? We'd probably normally look at using one of these guys in the case where our imagery data set is stored in our on-premises data arrays. So for example, we might uh, use GeoServer to host the imagery and use something like GeoWebCache uh, sitting at the front end to allow us uh, to manage the cache uh, that results from that service. Uh, this is mostly stuff that most of us in, in this room have seen before. Um, but we did run into a problem. So the Airbus data set was simply too large to store on our local data arrays. Uh, instead, we had it transferred into our Amazon Cloud Storage. So uh, the specific service we're talking about here is Amazon's Simple Storage Service, or S3. So S3 has a whole host of great features. It's one of AWS's core services. Uh, I won't spend too much time talking about the S3 features, but what's important for us to know in the context of today's talk is that unlike in the situation where we have uh, data stored on hard disk and we might be accessing it via, for example, the I.O. protocol, uh, with S3, all object interaction happens over HTTP, and that will become important in a second. Um, I want to take a step back for a, for a moment and talk about JPEG 2000 data, however. So JPEG 2000 data, unlike more cloud-friendly formats like GeoTIFFs or COGS, uh, doesn't support range reading. And what this means in the context of generating a tile is to clip out a, an individual small tile from a source image we must first load the source image in its entirety into local memory. So these source images for our Airbus data set range anywhere between about the 700 megabyte to 1.5 gigabyte size. So we're talking about fairly large files. So in a traditional scenario, uh, this isn't an issue. We see IO uh, loading these uh, source image files very quickly. It's a very fast protocol, and as a result, we're very unlikely to see any bottleneck forming at that stage. But when we put HTTP in the middle in a cloud scenario, we get a situation where we're going to start to see a very large bottleneck forming uh, just in terms of reading the data across the network. So it pretty quickly became clear to us that these source image files of a gigabyte or more were just simply going to be too big to, to be able to efficiently transfer them around the network. So we needed to consider another strategy. And this is a basic visualisation of what we came up with. No prizes for guessing where that is. Uh, we created a simple GDAL Python script to 
break the source images down into smaller imagery chunks. Uh, those chunks were around the 20 megabyte mark, which by trial and error we found to be best uh, in terms of transferring them across the network. Uh, the script also created a PostGIS database uh, and basically put the uh, metadata that, that was extracted from the source images into that database and most importantly for our purposes here, it stored the information about the uh, geospatial boundaries for each uh, resulting imagery chunk that allowed uh, fast querying later on in the process. <coughs> so this is all well and good, but generally speaking, pre-processing 187 terabytes of imagery in this way is pretty uh, prohibitively slow. So we looked at doing this on our uh, existing on-premises uh, enterprise infrastructure, basically, uh, and we found that it would have taken about two months to complete this over 187 terabytes which was really too slow for our, our needs. But cloud really came to the rescue for us here. So by using a technology in AWS called an auto-scaling group, we were able to take a process which would have otherwise taken a couple of months and complete it in just a couple of days. And really that comes down to the ability of cloud infrastructure to scale in response to demand. So the auto-scaling group effectively describes a, a collection of servers, or in Amazon speak, EC2s, um, each EC2 in this scenario was GPU optimised for the task at hand. All of those EC2s were working in parallel in order to complete this task. So the way that we had it set up was that we created a queue, each item on the queue representing an individual object um, uh, or a source image basically. Uh, each server would pull down an item from the queue, generate the source imagery chunks uh, for that source uh, image and then move on to the next one when it was finished. So really the, the value add here was the, uh, the scale of the infrastructure that we could leverage. So to give you an idea, um, throughout the runtime of this process, we actually used about 7.3 terabytes of virtual memory, which is orders of magnitude higher than what we could have achieved in our traditional on-premises environment. Um, not to mention we didn't have to set anything up uh, in our uh, on-premises environment. We simply uh, uh, leveraged the service in AWS. So after this had completed, we had the source data in a structure that we could use it efficiently. The next step in the process was to consider how we were actually going to go about generating the tiles themselves. So to this end, we wrote a small uh, Python script using Rasterio or Raster.io. The pronunciation <coughs> seems to be a little bit controversial. Uh, the script took the geospatial bounds for a given tile uh, and performed a geospatial lookup uh, against the PostGIS index that we created from the database I mentioned earlier. Um, that lookup then told the script which uh, source imagery chunks needed to be pulled down in order to compose the given tile. Uh, once that was done, it then pulled those uh, source imagery chunks down uh, and used Rasterio to merge and clip the data with, and the end result was a Base64 encoded JPEG tile. So once we'd got this working uh, in uh, a manner that we were happy with in our desktop environment, the next step was to consider how we were going to go about deploying it in a production scenario. Certainly the one option we considered was to simply deploy it uh, in the traditional manner onto a virtual server or a small cluster of virtual servers. But given that we were already working in the AWS environment uh, and we had some interesting services uh, at our disposal, we thought we could do a little bit better. So this brings us nicely to talking about Lambda. So AWS Lambda is a managed service that provides what's known as function as a service. So in other words, this means the developer brings some code, sets up some custom triggers and some custom outputs, and then AWS takes care of the underlying infrastructure required to run the function, as well as the entire runtime environment for that function. In our case, using Lambda as a deployment mechanism offered a few distinct advantages. So firstly and most importantly, we were able to get a fairly significant uh, performance advantage from using Lambda, and that comes back to that, that idea of uh, horizontal scaling. So with Lambda, we can easily run multiple thousands of tile generations uh, in response to requests uh, at any one given time. So it scales up automatically to match the load and scales itself down when it's not needed. So really this translates to a fairly significant performance increase for a WMTS service. Anybody who's worked with WMTS before knows that we're likely to see batches of tile requests coming in. 
And we want to be able to generate all of those tiles in parallel if we can to make the performance of the services as high as possible. And Lambda suits that need really well. The other thing to note with Lambda is that we only pay for the actual runtime of the function. So when Lambda receives a tile request uh, in isolation, for example, it spins up some infrastructure in the background and then subsequently spins the infrastructure down when the tile request, uh, the tile generation is finished. So this makes it very cost efficient since it means that we only pay for the actual runtime, the, the actual time it takes to, to generate any given tile. Lastly, as with all serverless technologies, Lambda simply <coughs> removes the need for us to manage our own infrastructure. So that means no health checks, no patching, no manual scaling. It's all taken care of on our behalf, which makes our job as developers much, much easier. So the final step in the process, once we had got the, the capability to a place uh, where we could generate tiles on the fly, was to expose it via, via HTTP. So we wanted to be able to take users' HTTP requests from their software clients, for example, uh, and generate tiles in response. Luckily, AWS has a service specifically for this requirement. So AWS's API gateway really does what it says on the box. So it receives HTTP requests, extracts the request parameters from uh, that, that request, and uh, integrates them into the backend. So that's Lambda in our case. When Lambda then finishes and returns some information, API gateway uh, handles that information, performs some transformation, and then pumps out a HTTP response uh, in response to the requester. So in addition to providing this classic HTTP front door to our capability, uh, API Gateway also offered the ability to uh, transform incoming request parameters on the fly. And this was a feature that really came in handy for us when we were looking at supporting multiple tile schemas for our API. So we certainly could have taken care of the mathematics and the transformations required to uh, transform between tile schemas within the Lambda itself. But what we found was that um, we had much better results if we black boxed the Lambda function uh, and left it alone, let it do the tile generation in isolation, and abstracted a lot of that, uh, a lot of that transformation uh, mathematics into the API itself. So uh, API Gateway made that really easy by providing a GUI in order to help us manage those transformations, uh, and really uh, made it a lot easier, less laborious in terms of uh, supporting all of those tile schemas. So putting it all together, I'm conscious of time here, uh, this is the final workflow. I realise there's a lot of information on this slide, uh, but basically what I wanted to highlight was uh, that the total time taken from when a user requests a tile from the API to when that tile is returned to them is uh, less than two seconds. So we're, we get pretty good performance out of this system. Uh, if you look closely here, you'll notice there's a few elements which I haven't covered in detail. Uh, specifically, I haven't talked about the tile caching strategy, and I've really only paid lip service to the uh, indexation, which is fairly complex behind the scenes. Uh, but my goal today was to give you an idea of some of the flagship services in AWS and how we can chain them together to create a system that's greater than the sum of its parts. So where to from here? Uh, the performance of the current solution is a little bit variable for our liking, particularly over areas of the world where we have a lot of overlapping source imagery. Uh, we'd like to investigate some strategies to uh, improve the performance uh, across the board, but also uh, to make it a little bit more consistent. So that could extend to multi-level tile caching, uh, further tuning of our Lambda uh, to sort of be more in line with what we needed to use it for, uh, as well as applying some smarts to our tile generation script um, in, in terms of uh, making it generate tiles as, as quickly and efficiently for us as possible. Um, one example of that is that uh, we're looking at using the JPEG 2000 Kakadu drivers since, since we understand it may provide some performance benefits over the OpenJPEG implementation that we're currently using. Uh, we'd also like to increase the number of clients that this system supports, and a big part of that will be fleshing out the API with some of those peripheral re request parameters uh, to enable uh, us to be more in line with ODC standards. Uh, so that's all I have for today. I will return to that uh, architecture slide, but I'm happy to take any questions with the short amount of time we've got. Thank you. Thanks, Dylan. I was going to mention that Kakadu driver because I understand that it does support HTTP range requests. Right, well, there you go. So that's, uh, that's, that's something we're definitely investigating at the moment. Um, we were introduced to Kakadu fairly late in the process, but, yep. uh, but we, we hear it's, uh, it's pretty good at this kind of stuff. Yeah. So. I, I'm suspicious that uh, JPEG, the open JPEG one does too, but it's not as fast as Kakadu. Right, right. 
Anyhow, uh, we've got time for questions from the audience. So if anybody's got a question, just wait for me to come up with the microphone. I'll get my exercise going up here. G'day. Um, the AWS Lambda deployment package has a pretty limited size on it, so and GDAL can quite quickly blow that right out of the water. Can you talk about how you managed to make the package small enough to get into an, uh, a Lambda-sized deployment package? Yeah, I, th I thought somebody might ask about this because you're absolutely right. Um, so it is worth highlighting that uh, there are a couple of cheats that you can do uh, to get around that. Um, so probably the, the biggest thing I'd highlight first of all is, and you, you might be aware of this, um, if you are deploying deployment packages into Lambda, you can uh, increase the amount of uh, the size of the deployment package that's accepted by uploading to S3 first and then providing that link. Um, but yes, we did run into a lot of issues, and I didn't really have time to go into detail here today. Um, we ran, a lot of, ran into a lot of issues in terms of packaging uh, Lambda. What we found worked best for us was using Docker as a, uh, as a staging environment for that. So, we were able to use Docker and some um, pre-compiled uh, uh, GDAL builds to really uh, cut down on what we actually wanted to include. But even then, we're running pretty close to the, the edge there. So our deployment package is running around the 60 megabyte mark, which is sort of pushing up on that. Um, I, I have heard that there might be some uh, consideration of uh, AWS increasing that limit, but um, that watch this space. Yes? Hi. Do you generate <clears throat> all the tiles all at once, or do you use some sort of predictive algorithm to generate them, to pre-generate them on the fly? Yeah, good question. So uh, basically, we generate um, a number of levels of tiles at the top. Um, so we generate down to uh, level 11 and cache all of that, just for fast access. Um, then all of the tiles which are uh, generated on the fly um, via HTTP request are then cached. So, <laughs> Um, any tile that has been generated in the past can be quickly retrieved from the cache. Um, all other tiles are, are generated uh, yeah, on the fly, basically. Right at the top. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, I was just wanting to ask about the um, security of it. So is all this map like classified or unclassified or how do you provide like is there different access for certain users or you know providing tiles at certain levels yeah good uh, I'm gonna try to answer this it's not my area but I'll do my best um, so first of all all of this data is unclassified um, it's uh, sourced from it's sourced commercially um, so while we can't distribute it because of commercial licensing um, it is uh, completely unclassified so none of it's uh, collected as part of our classified um, uh, workflows um, so that removes some of the, the issue there, but uh, in terms of only providing access to certain uh, users, we use uh, IP range um, uh, restrictions on the API. Uh, so previously we had been using IP range restrictions on S3. Uh, what isn't shown particularly well here is that all the tiles actually use S3 as the, um, the creation point before they are then accessed. Um, but we found that API gateway handles that way, way better. So. Um, so just by restricting the IP ranges there, that's gone a long way towards doing this. What we do want to integrate in the future is uh, LDAP integration uh, to allow uh, only certain uh, roles uh, to access the, uh, the data, but that's something that's going to probably come a little bit later for us. <laughs>